Hello there, uh, I'm Arlen. I just wanted to uh, extend once again a uh, thank you uh, to uh, Nural and to everyone else uh, who was involved in, in putting this together. And it is really my great uh, pleasure um, to, to be here with you today and uh, to speak with you um, about something that I think about quite a lot, um, which is, um, is the way that the Ottoman past, um, or I should say pasts, plural perhaps, uh, intersects with the world that we live in now. Um, so, I mean, although the year is 2017, we live in an Ottoman century, despite the archaic uh, dated associations often conjured by the phrase Ottoman, this dynamic and long-lived imperial structure was an integral part of the cultural and geopolitical regions we call Europe and the Middle East less than 100 years ago. Hence, in the grand sweep of history, the passing of the Ottoman Empire remains a relatively recent event, and the repercussions of its collapse perhaps more so than its actual functioning, are very much still with us today. Yet since its fall in the years after the, the First World War, the Great War of the 1910s, the history of the Ottoman Empire has been constantly reevaluated by historians and public commentators alike. However, especially in its successor states, which of course uh, includes the Republic of Turkey, uh, alongside some 35, 36 other modern nation states, the Ottoman legacy has been uh, largely viewed either as a heritage better left forgotten, uh, a past to be rewritten in contemporary terms, rewritten at times in nationalist terms, or even as a dark period of violence and oppression against which present realities are to be const constantly measured. Now, uh, on my part, I'm very much interested in the ways that imperial societies can enjoy a certain degree of afterlife in contexts far removed from their own existence. Take, for instance, the importance, of, or the importance of the legacy of the Roman Empire uh, in early modern Europe, or that of the Mughal Empire in modern South Asia. In this sense, the legacies of empires uh, can, can function almost like brands, whereby the symbols that evoke their greatness, or perhaps their tyranny, remain visible to the people who build societies in the wake of their destruction. Uh, in my view, this is very much the case with the memory of the Ottoman Empire in parts of contemporary Southeastern Europe, North Africa, uh, and the Middle East. Um, so, I mean, uh, in, in concert with this overall theme, I've, I, I've titled um, my presentation, as you see here, Shadows of the Shadows of God. Um, of course, uh, the notion that the Ottoman Sultan was uh, the shadow of God on Earth is, is what I'm drawing on here. Uh, and as you can see, I titled it Unearthing the Ottoman Dynasty in the 21st Century because it's the sense that when we dig in the past in different periods of time, based on the lenses we have available to us, we come up with uh, different results. So um, today I will try to contribute to our understanding of the afterlife of empire via my research into the cultural presence of the Ottoman dynasty, the House of Osman, uh, in Ottoman and post-Ottoman society. So while I generally look at the ways in which Ottomans view their imperial house themselves uh, in the period when we actually have an Ottoman empire, it's clear that the dynasty is becoming increasingly visible today as an element of Ottoman nostalgia, for better or for worse, in various parts of the post-Ottoman uh, world. So while their time as God's shadows on earth have ended, I argue that their own shadows continue to be cast on most, most of the, or much of the post-Ottoman geography, and that their memory continues to shape contemporary debates about national history, uh, belonging, and exclusivity. So um, before I turn to some examples, I just want to say a few words uh, about the picture of the empire and uh, more specifically of the house, the house of Osman that emerges from uh, the scholarly literature, the sort of work that historians do with their own particular tools. So in front of us here, uh, we have uh, sort of an image, uh, a false image from space that shows you the, the extent of the, of the Ottoman geography. Uh, at its largest reach in the 17th century, as you can see, it spans um, a, a quite an uh, extensive geography, quite uh, a large, uh, especially cultural geography. So um, the Ottoman Empire was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious state and society, ruled by a Muslim dynasty that existed from the late medieval period, around uh, 1300, until the 1920s, so quite uh, an impressive span of time. As the inheritors of, of uh, Islamic, Turkic, and Roman traditions of empire, the Ottomans created one of the most diverse, influential, and important societies in world history. Yet unlike many other empires, 
The Ottoman Empire was ruled by a single family, a single dynasty, throughout its entire uh, existence. This here, of course, uh, is a, a, uh, an illustration of the Ottoman family tree from the mid-19th century, which represents, in turn, one of the central and recurrent visual metaphors um, for, for the Ottoman dynasty and the state they created. From Osman Ghazi, the founder, at the bottom grew a great tree, um, which, uh, as it grows, uh, encompasses the world in its shade. Now, much like his subjects, the ruling sultan did not identify himself or his family with modern forms of nationality or ethnicity. To the contrary, according to Ottoman imperial culture and the sources that we have available to us, the sultan was king of kings, caliph of Islam, Roman emperor, the Alexander the Great of his time, uh, and God's shadow on earth, amongst uh, many other uh, identities simultaneously held. While many of his subjects saw him as one of God's principal agents in his divine plan, Others saw him, his family, and his empire as a form of he heavenly punishment for the sins of humanity. And as, as you can see, this is uh, quite a, quite a uh, diversity of, of views. He typically spoke Persian, Arabic, and Ottoman Turkish, or Osmanlıca, amongst other languages. Uh, possessed, and he possessed mystical powers to cure disease, inflict blindness, posthumously answer the prayers of his subjects, or even appear at times in their dreams. He oversaw the meeting out of justice, occasionally led his armies in battle, and sometimes even walked amongst his subjects in disguise so as to personally check on the state of his empire. Um, so moving on from sort of the scholarly realm, which is a very rarefied space, it's called at times uh, the ivory tower for a reason. I want to comment briefly on, on, um, uh, on a subject that uh, the uh, last two presenters uh, very much touched on, which is the emergence of a kind of Ottoman nostalgia, a kind of Neo-Ottomanism, if you will, on a popular level uh, in Turkey in the, in the middle uh, 20th century. Um, I think I would very much agree with what's been said so far. I mean, in this period, um, the Turkish government becomes more comfortable with public expressions of a historical Ottomanness as a precedent for national Turkishness. And, and a picture of the Ottoman Empire uh, that emerges in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in Turkey um, very much as a Turkified dynasty, a Turkish dynasty ruling over a Turkish uh, empire. Uh, so here I have uh, a map from the 1920s, uh, a map of Turkey, which still, as you can see, is represented uh, in, in the Persian Arabic script. Um, and uh, in addition to having sort of a, a lady, a, a Turkish lady leader here and a, and, a, and a heroic soldier, we have the, the uh, founder, the founding president of the Republic Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. So, I mean, ironically here, while the, this map of the New Republic is um, still representing uh, this geography in the language of the Ottomans. The, the figures, the personae chosen here, are fundamentally supposed to be not Ottoman. They are, the, they are representing in various bodily forms the new look, the new self, the new Turk of the Republic. If we move now to, to the middle 20th century, this is a very different picture. This is uh, a map used in Turkish uh, uh, primary education to, to acquaint young people with um, their, their nation state and its history. This is actually a very Anatolia, a very sort of uh, uh, anachronistic representation of the Ottoman uh, expansion. And uh, it, it sort of puts Anatolia at the center of, of Ottoman uh, politics, which it, it arguably wasn't. But I mean, these figures here uh, are, are very um, uh, Ottoman in a way that the early Republican um, sort of cultural stewards perhaps would have been less comfortable with. We have Fatih uh, doing some conquering in Istanbul. Uh, uh, Sultan uh, Suleiman is, is, is conquering up towards um, Central Europe, and Yad Musalim, of course, is securing uh, the Hejaz, the, the holy cities. Uh, amongst them still is, is Mustafa Kemal here um, doing some um, heroic uh, military uh, endeavor at the Battle of Gallipoli in World War I. But I mean, this is clearly a very uh, changed landscape as um, uh, public culture, at least in some form, in Turkey becomes much more comfortable with, with owning these figures as, 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 as Turks, if you will, um, and with, with, with having this sort of, uh, sort of Ottomanist part of, of Turkish identity. Now, um, this is something that, that I don't think anyone has uh, commented yet uh, today. Um, so, of course, in more recent years, this increased interest in the dynasty has also spread to the realm of, of Turkish Republican uh, government, to the realm of officialdom. So in addition to a series of comments that hint 
had a pronounced comfortability with embracing Ottoman and, Isla as a, and Islamic history as a part of modern Turkish identity, current President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has also made a number of statements and gestures that make explicit reference not only to Ottoman traditions, but to Ottoman traditions of sovereignty and of emperorship, specifically to um, uh, Ottoman rulers. Now, for instance, um, he paid a visit to the tomb of Sultan Murad I, a 14th century sultan, uh, in 2010, and this tomb actually is, is not in Turkey, it is in Kosovo. And he personally laid a wreath at, at the statues of Sultan Suleiman and Nikola Shubic Zilinski near the Park of Hungarian and Turkish Friendship in, in Hungary. So there's, there's a, an attention that he's paying to him, personally paying respect to these individuals. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, he also visited the tombs of Mehmed the Conqueror, Selim I, and Ayyub al-Ansari, a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, in the immediate aftermath of the recent uh, referendum in Turkey, which of course uh, which, which changed uh, Turkey's uh, political system to accommodate uh, a much more powerful presidency, uh, which was in turn supported by Erdogan and his, his uh, Justice and Development Party, the AKP. And I, I want to stress here that the last of these visits the visit of the president to the companion of the prophet is especially uh, uh, germane to us here because this was a tradition reserved to the Ottoman sultans. Visiting um, the, uh, the tomb uh, of Ayat was something that sultans did when they took the throne to, in a way, uh, in, in a sort of ritual form, demonstrate that they now uh, were, uh, that they now had taken on the role of emperor. So it, it is very interesting if we try and uh, think about how um, this Ottoman afterlife, how its symbols are being wielded by contemporary people in politics. I mean, I have, um, I have difficulty seeing this any other way. So, as a means to explore the contemporary relevance of the House of Osman outside of the Republic, uh, outside of, the Republic of Turkey, which is important, we focus a lot on Turkey, um, but it, of course, uh, is not the only successor state. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to stick to the subject of, of Ottoman burial. Where are dead sultans today? Um, so, in, uh, so when Ottoman sultans passed on to the afterlife, their bodies were typically entombed either in Bursa or in Istanbul, with Edirne, the uh, empire's second city for some 400 years, left conspicuously absent from dynastic burial patterns. Thus, the overwhelming majority of sultans are at rest within the political boundaries of the republic, uh, which I have hinted at uh, thus far, is ever more interested in claiming the House of Osman um, as, as, as Turks uh, in the modern sense of the word. However, of course, uh, a number of sultans who died while on campaign were buried in whole or in part in regions completely outside of the contemporary republic. So while this fact would have been rather uh, incidental, it would have made a difference before uh, the collapse of the empire, it has made all the more significant given that these sultans' bodies now reside in Ottoman successor states that have vehemently distinguished themselves from all things Ottoman in their historical culture over the last century. Nevertheless, for our purposes today in exploring um, uh, uh, Ottoman nostalgia, neo-Ottomanism, whatever, whatever you want to call it, the ongoing controversy surrounding uh, the place of sultanic tombs outside of, of Turkey aptly demonstrate their relevance to contemporary debates about the place uh, of the Ottoman past in a national present. So take, for example, the excavation project in Sigetvar, Hungary, in search for the remains of Suleiman the Magnificent, part of the Ottoman world since the conquest uh, of, the medieval kingry, uh, of the medieval kingdom of Hungary in the 1500s. Sigetvar was the site of the last siege of Suleiman's life in 1566. Having died in his war tent outside the city at the age of 71, it is reputed that his heart liver, and other internal organs were buried in the nearby Ottoman settlement of Turbek, while his body, or most of it, was returned to Istanbul to be entombed in his grand mosque complex, the Suleiman Yajami. Now, aside from the historical value of the project, its current and future success has raised hopes that the town of, of Sigetvar, with its shrinking population of some 10,000 persons, will receive a demographic and economic boost given the growing popularity of Suleiman as a historical hero in Turkey and beyond. While Hungary's 150-year period as an Ottoman province tends to be viewed in that country, at least in official narratives, as a kind of dark age that put an end to the cultural fluorescence, uh, fluorescence that is, of the medieval kingdom, 
Many residents of Sigetbar are happy to see the attention directed towards their town. Dr. Norbert Papp, the leader of the excavation, is quite optimistic himself, stating that, quote, Suleiman can bring in jobs, income, and tourists. <laughs> Other birth voices express a similar willingness to accept the Ottomans, in their words, of course, the Turks, as part of the history of Sigetbar. At first, the Turks were our enemies, says one resident, but that was so long ago that we don't have any problem with them anymore, especially if they bring some money here. <laughs> so, although the 16th century interaction between the Ottoman Empire and the Kingdom of Hungary occurred on markedly different historical circumstances than those in which, for instance, this memorial was created, it serves as an instructive reference point for imagining the shared history of two national republics, and the deceased body of an Ottoman sultan, or rather, in this case, parts of his body, lie at the center of this debate. I mean, that is really the center point of, of the conversation. In the body of the Ottoman sultan, both Hungarians and Turks alike see, quote, Turkish history, although the ways in which they see that history connecting to their own national present differ considerably. Hungarians, at least some, see a reminder of a Turkish uh, subjugation or Turkish dominance or colonization. Yet the fact of the sultan's burial in Hungary nevertheless appears to offer at least uh, some, some Hungarians with the promise of a brighter future, uh, in spite of Suleiman's great, uh, growing popularity specifically uh, as a Turkish figure. Um, a similar yet perhaps more controversial case of point can be found in, in another Ottoman successor state, uh, namely Syria, where the tomb of Suleiman Shah, thought to be the grandfather of, of Osman Ghazi, the, the, uh, the founder of the empire, has been located since the 13th century. Although the tomb has been moved twice since its establishment in 1236, it has always remained well within uh, uh, contemporary Syrian territories. Even so, the tomb and its immediate surroundings have been consistently claimed by the government of Turkey since the 1920s, and I should say, of course, that this legal reality was in turn um, uh, established quite clearly in the two treaties from that decade. This unusual pattern of sovereignty, wherein uh, you know, this is, is Turkish soil, um, was manifested uh, on the ground by the maintenance of a small Turkish honor guard, the flying of the Turkish flag, and transit rights to the tomb granted by Syria to enable service and repairs uh, to, to its structure by Turkish uh, officials. However, more recently, as the threat of damage to the tomb by various participants in the Syrian civil war and other surrounding conflicts increased, in 2015, Turkish forces entered Syria in order, in order to re relocate the tomb uh, once more. This time, only 200 meters or so away from the Turkish border. The move was condemned by the government of Syria, although uh, uh, Turkish uh, officials have claimed the move does not itself constitute a permanent relocation, nor does it constitute a change to the legal status of the tomb. So while the life and person of Suleyman Shah again, a 13th century sort of grandfather of the dynasty, was somewhat marginal in the early years of the Republic. The actions of the Turkish government over recent decades, you know, including this case and, and others, hint at an ongoing Turkish ownership of the Ottoman past that extends quite explicitly at times to the House of Osman and the vestiges of their worldly remains, their, their bodies. Uh, this, of course, is an arena of national identity once thought to be completely antithetical to the, the, the Turkishness of, of the Republic's founding fathers. The Turkishness, the official um, sense of being Turkish and belonging to the space uh, of Ataturk and his uh, repel, re fellow uh, Republican company. Now, to be sure, the maintenance of an extraterritorial Turkish presence uh, via a, a very specific demarcated section of, of Turkish soil in Syria should not perhaps be viewed as devoid of geopolitical considerations. Yet, for our purposes today, um, it is nonetheless instructive to note that the tomb, a space inextricably related to the body of, the member of, uh, uh, of a member of the Ottoman dynasty, which of course is now long defunct, remains one of the more hotly contested of Turkey's sovereign territory outside of the actual uh, Anatolian borders of the Republic. So let me say some words uh, in conclusion um, that for me are germane to what I, I shared with you today, but also to this topic at large. To my mind, the recent interest in Ottoman history, the resurgence in interest, and in the House of Osman in particular, uh, within the Ottoman geography and outside, may not in fact be as unusual as, as it appears. And I would extend this to the 
um, the interest uh, in Turkey starting from the mid 20th century. Now, given the nearly universal denial of the Ottoman past throughout much of the 20th century, the pronounced 21st century interest appears to me more like a return to the historical tastes of previous centuries, when the Ottoman Empire was still around, and its diverse subjects, as well as foreign commentators, often contemplated the history of the sublime state dynasty and its role in shaping and creating their imperial world. The notion that inhabitants of this particular space, uh, Southeastern Europe, uh, Middle East, North Africa, should turn to the legacies of Mehmed the Conqueror and, and Suleiman the Magnificent in hopes of better understanding their personal and communal circumstances is not a strictly post-Ottoman uh, phenomenon, but rather to some extent an Ottoman survival. While the terms in which the Ottoman past is now remembered often uh, deviates very drastically from what historians think they know, the very act of paying significant attention to the legacy of the House of Osman is in some ways, to me at least, more of a continuity than a rupture with the previous eras. By extension, of course, the 20th century, the 1900s, can be seen as a pronounced break from larger historical trends, in that the memory of the Ottoman Empire was typically ignored, downplayed, downplayed, erased, or outright demonized in many contexts. Rejected by the vast majority of its successor states, it spent much of the century in a state of virtual uh, oblivion. Not complete oblivion, of course. Thus, as interest in the Ottoman Empire continues to extend well beyond the scholarly realm in Turkey and beyond, we might do well to remark on the strangeness of the last century instead of the novelty of recent decades. At the same time, of course, and I think um, I've heard some, uh, overheard some conversations alluding to this, um, to some extent we can also see this interest as a phenomenon spearheaded by the same kind of nationalist forces that affected the systematic forgetting of the empire in the first place. To be sure, adherents, adherents of various, various nationalisms are now, in some cases, taking up the symbols, uh, attaching themselves to the afterlife of the Ottoman legacy, and selectively appropriating that past on their own terms, seeking to manipulate, own, and even repaint that past in their image. So much like in South Asia, where Hindu and Muslim nationalists fight over the meaning of the Mughal imperial legacy, and in Europe, where various governments and movements have long contested ownership of the Romans, the former Ottoman space is now witnessing a kind of a shift in the ways that many of its people conceive of their national present in relation to their Ottoman heritage. Altogether, recent developments indicate that in spite of the end of the Ottoman order some 95 years ago, that we remain in the shadows of the shadows of God and in the shadow of the Ottoman Empire as the last Ottoman century draws to a close. Thanks. <laughs>